Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real genius. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. A quick note uh, from the foundation, we're working on an anxiety and depression project. Our goal is to make a low or no-cost resource for people that suffer. And the way we're going about it is we're assembling several thousand resources, so books, lectures, peer-reviewed papers, alternative medicine, et cetera. And our goal is to uncover as many p- treatments as possible and, again, provide it to people suffering. So if you have any interest in this project and uh, taking a look at it, donating to it, helping out, uh, please go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org. And today my guest is uh, Jenny Essler. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the Penn Vet Working Dog Center. It's a part of the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. And we're going to talk about her work. So Jenny, thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to uh, talk about my work. Yeah, Jenny, tell me about your background. Like, how did you start working with dogs and what got you interested in them? Yeah, it's funny. My background is in sort of animal behavior generally. I actually originally started working with uh, monkeys. (laughs) That was my first sort of research topic. And then I moved to wolves and dogs and then somehow ended with working dogs. I did a lot of work on cognition and behavior in the animals before I got to the working dogs. And I wanted to try and find a sort of more applied work to my interests. And that's what got me into the working dogs and sort of what landed me at the working dog center. Hmm, Okay. And when you say working dog, does that mean these are like emotional support? No. So most of them are, most of what we work with are like search and rescue dogs, explosives detection dogs, police dogs. I work with a lot of um, medical detection dogs. We have cancer detection dogs. We have COVID detection dogs, invasive species. So mostly detection dogs. So yeah, what are some of the jobs that that, uh, these trained dogs can do? Like I said, I know there's emotional support animals. There's, I guess, drug sniffing dogs. There's ones that can detect cancer. Like what are some of the other jobs that dogs can have? Yeah, so we have had bed bug detection dogs come out of the center, arson detection dogs. Um, of course, there's the USAR, so live human detection, human remains detection, um, all different types of drug detection dogs. Sitting next to me is a COVID detection dog, or he was for our training purposes for research. So yeah, the sky is kind of the limit. I haven't been able to throw anything at them that they couldn't do yet. So uh, are you more of like a clinician? You just work with the dogs at the center or do you do some research as well into dogs? Yeah, so I actually am not a clinician. So I only do research. So my PhD is only in research. So Mm -hmm. I work with the, yeah, the research, the study design, the implementation side of the center. Okay, so what, what kind of research are you working on? What are you trying to figure out? So right now I'm working on a project that is investigating the link between the genotype and phenotype of working dogs to see if there are behaviors that we can link back to genotype to help us better produce better working dogs. So 
to inform our breeding, but also to choose better working dogs because I don't know how much you or your listeners know, but of course they go through tons of training. And then when they, when they fail out later by nine, 12 months, that's a really big sunk cost. So if there was some way to choose dogs earlier and spend less time on dogs that wouldn't work out anyway, that's kind of what I'm interested in trying to help that process along. But how do you know if, um, I mean, I, there's certain breeds that, you know, again, they're supposed to be uh, very good for this kind of training, like Australian shepherds and, you know, some of the other ones, but um and, and I know it depends on the application. I'm sure ones that'll smell cancer, maybe different breeds from ones that are, might be an emotional support animal. But like, how is it currently done? How do the experts know, okay, these kind of dogs are good for this kind of thing? That depends on which experts you're talking to. So I think every group has a different way of choosing which dogs are successful. So I can speak a little bit about what the center dog, uh, the center does for dogs. So we take puppies from breeders that have a history of working so that, you know, like you said, it depends on their breed, what working means. Um, And then we take them at eight weeks old and we expose them to lots of different careers and we let them sort of choose the career that they're better at, that they like the most and, and would be most successful at. And then we try and place them into that career. Okay. So what, um, what kind of applications are you focused on? Like, you said you've yet to find an application that dogs can't do, but you know, I know you can't look at everything. So what's your focus and why? Like what interests you? So I'm really interested. We just had a study. I'm not sure where exactly you're located. I'm located, of course, in Philadelphia. So we just had a study where we looked at whether we could use dogs to detect the invasive spotted lanternfly. So we trained them to detect spotted lanternfly eggs so that they could potentially be used to screen, you know, cargo going in and out of the quarantine zone. And that was something that I thought was really exciting because it's something that humans would be not very good at because a lot of the times the eggs are hidden, uh, but dogs are very good at because the odor is still there, even if your eyes can't see it. And we did end up deploying one dog with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And as far as I'm aware, she's doing really well. So that was the most exciting project that I've recently worked on, especially being able to see a dog actually go out and start working in the topic that I had just, you know, studied in the lab and showed the dogs could do. So what is this uh, genotype phenotype dichotomy? So phenotype, I guess, is, you know, all the characteristics that make that kind of dog, that kind of dog, like a Chihuahua versus a Great Dane, you know, very different phenotypes, but um, how are you trying to correlate, you know, genotype with phenotype? Yeah. So pretty much what we're looking at is we have lots of data at the center And we will, we have, you know, we've been open for since 2012. And so all of our dogs have lots of research on them. So lots of behavioral data on their training and different sort of studies we've done. And then of course, we also have their DNA. And so one thing we're looking at is whether there is some link between those two that we can use to inform in the future, you know, better choices of these dogs or placement of them into specific careers. Okay. But uh, so what are you looking for in your research? Like, are you trying to figure out, okay, if a dog has these genes, then that means that the phenotype's going to look like this and it'll be good for, you know, smelling uh, whatever, Belgian rats or something. Like, <laughs> how, do you, how do you correlate this? So potentially. So one of the things that we're interested in, so for example, is, you know, everyone wants a dog to have really high toy engagement, right? They want the dog to really work for the toy and really enjoy working for the toy and kind of be crazy for the toy. And so that might be a phenotype that has some genetic basis and something that varies between individuals based on their genes. And that's sort of what we're looking at, whether that's true or not. Oh, but again, have you been able to correlate? Um, (laughs) Does it look like that there's, are there dozens or hundreds of genes? Uh, Are there a lot of overlaps? Like, what does the landscape look like so far? So I'm not on the genetic side of the project. I'm only on the phenotype side of the project. So we're still collecting data. So the amount of data that we need to actually pair those two is a lot. The center has about 100 graduates. um, So we're actually going to be expanding that and trying to recruit dogs from other centers and other um, placements as well to be part of our study, just to up that number. Because to work with something like that with the genetic side, you need hundreds of dogs, not a hundred dogs or 50 dogs. So right now we're still in the data collection phase. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, 
We need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. Uh, in terms of phenotypes, so you said that not all dogs that get trained, you know, are successful. So wh- why do they fall out? What happens at the end of their training to say, like, damn it, this dog just, for some reason, they're, they're failing? Like, what happens to them? Yeah, it's really interesting. So I can I can speak again just about what we've seen at the center. So a lot of what we see is environmental instability. So it would be something like they're really nervous of sounds or you couldn't have a dog that is a search rescue dog that doesn't like unstable surfaces, right? Because you want them to be comfortable searching on rubble piles. So it's usually things like that, that end up being reasons that they don't succeed in different careers versus something like, you know, we've never had a dog that couldn't use their nose. It's, it's actually some of our best dogs. So some of our cancer detection dogs have really bad environmental stability. And that's why they couldn't go out to be detection dogs that were deployed somewhere else. But because, you know, working in the lab is very consistent and the environment doesn't change very much, they can still use their nose, you know, to work in that environment. And so it's, like I said, it's really the environmental stability more so than, you know, my dog doesn't know how to sniff things. Can you restate it in a different way? Like what's, uh, again, <laughs> what, what usually makes them fail? Up? Yeah, so it's usually things like they're afraid of really loud sounds. So you wouldn't want a dog that's working on the streets as an explosive detection dog that is afraid of sounds, right? Or they're afraid of people, or they're afraid of dogs. So usually it's fears like that, that cause them to be less likely to succeed. Um, Other fears might be being afraid of like an unstable surface. So having something wobbly underneath you or weird surfaces. So there are dogs that like don't like going over grates. Um, and so that yeah. environmental stability, that ability to work in novel and different environments is something that's really important. And that's usually what's lacking in the dogs that aren't as successful or aren't able to be placed compared to dogs that are. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, is there anything else though about the dogs that is hidden to you? Like, like how often are there surprises and, and do you <laughs> step in and say, okay, I think this dog has a very high likelihood of being successful. It doesn't appear to have any bad traits or anything, but you're still wrong. Like what, how often does it yeah. go wrong? Honestly, the center that I work at right now is very lucky because we train for lots of different careers. We have a really high success rate. So even if a dog, like we might have a dog that, you know, goes nine, 12 months and we think it's going to be a really successful search and rescue dog. And then suddenly it, you know, has a fear of people. And you obviously can't have a search and rescue dog that's afraid of finding people because that's its job. So we have to place it into another career. And I wouldn't say that happens that often, but it happens often enough that that's sort of why we're looking into this so that we can place dogs into their proper careers earlier. Okay, that makes sense. So how do you hope to improve upon this method? What's, how's this going to work with the genotyping and stuff? Like, how do you, how do you get better at it? Yeah, I mean, obviously, in the perfect world, uh, you know, the end of the rainbow is some genetic markers of all of these things that we see as reasons that dogs fail out. It probably Mm. won't be that simple because genetics just never are that simple. Um, But hopefully it can be used to at least make informed decisions potentially on extremes. So there has been found, you know, genetic basis for other sorts of behaviors in dogs. So like noise sensitivities, I think there has been found some genetic markers for not to the extreme that um, we might be worried about. But because we have found some potential genetic markers in some breeds for these behaviors, we're hoping that for working dogs, it might be possible to find genetic markers for them as well, so that we can use it to, you know, screen dogs earlier before we implement all of that training into them. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Okay, it makes sense. I don't know, what's the, uh, I mean, you're doing this research and stuff, are you hopeful? Like, what? What so far are you getting from doing this? Like what's, what's jumping out at you? Yeah, I mean, I'm really hopeful. So I'm on the, like I said, I'm on the phenotype side of this. So my job is mostly watching videos of the dogs and scoring them into some way that it turns into numbers that we can compare with the genetics. And certainly, you know, in my 
time looking at these videos, there's a lot of variability in their behavior, which does bode well for there being potentially variability in the genetics as well. And so I'm really hopeful that it that it works out how we want, or at least that it's helpful because, you know, the U.S. has a shortage of detection dogs. And so anything that we can do to help create better detection dogs, but also help them create more detection dogs is going to be really helpful for the country in general. Yeah, that makes sense. Again, do you know the metrics like uh, are certain breeds, do they have a much lower like error rate than other breeds? Yeah, that's a hard question to answer because the field hasn't really branched out very far outside of the typical breeds. So you have a lot of like Labrador Retrievers, um, German Shorthair Pointers, some Malinois and German Shepherds. And those are kind of the really big ones. Sometimes there's Springer Spaniels in there, but they're pretty much all working breeds and all of the ones that you would probably be not surprised to, I don't know, see at airport screenings or something like that. And so it's hard to say whether there's breed differences on like success rates just because the breeds that we typically use are there's only there's only so few of them there's only so many of them and so to compare them is very difficult oh so there's no data like uh you know belgian malinois for search and rescue you know they have a low is there okay so the variation in dogs within a particular breed is it oh, enough yeah. so that you can't say like you know Belgian yeah. Malinois are much less likely to have personality issues that stop them from doing search and rescue, but other breeds are more variable. Like, have you noticed that? Yeah. So, I mean, I could only speak anecdotally, but not really. So the thing is that you have to have a lot of dogs to look at that. And because we just don't have that data, it's not really possible to say. I mean, as much as a, as much as breeds differ between each other, right? A Labrador is really different from a Mal. They also have really big heterogeneity within themselves. So they're very different within themselves. So there's a lot of Labradors that we have that are really good at search and rescue and a lot that just really aren't really good for another reason. And, you know, that's part of sort of what we're looking at. So we're looking at all a lot of different breeds, not just one or two breeds. And that's kind of what we're trying to get into is that the, the difference between individuals versus breeds as a whole, because you could choose a breed as a whole, but you could probably be more successful potentially if you could get into the little more minute differences between the personality of the individuals versus the breed differences. Is there any way to tell when a dog is young, when it's at a puppy stage uh, to, you know, do some easy testing on it to see how, you know, what it's like. So you don't get to nine or 12 months and be like, <laughs> Oh no. Yeah. So that's what, that's exactly what we're doing. So a lot of my testing that we're looking at starts at four weeks old and goes all the way up until 12 months. And so what part of what we're looking at is does their behavior on those early tests correlate to their behavior on their late tests? And like, how early can you see, you know, a fear of noises or a fear of heights or a fear of people or something like that? So when does that behavior become consistent within that dog? And for some dogs, it does happen really early. So I just had a puppy from a litter that I helped raise that was really afraid of heights, um, very young, and she stayed pretty uncomfortable with heights as she grew. That's not to say every puppy follows that. So some are afraid of heights and get over it, but some do seem to have, you know, this innate fear of things. And so that's kind of what we're trying to get at with the genetic side of it because it could potentially be a lot quicker than, you know, having someone like me go back and test all of these puppies and watch all these videos and then tell somebody if there was a genetic marker for it, you know, it could be as simple as like a blood test or a cheek swab. But again, there's no standard right now on how to evaluate these dogs sooner. So every agency that has dogs has their own way of testing them. So there's no like national standard for every group that everyone uses. And that's probably part of the problem. That's part of why we don't have a lot of very consistent data is because a lot of, you know, most of these groups are doing lots of different things and not doing the same thing for every dog. Um, so what, I don't know, what do you anticipate the future of your research is going to look like, you know, over the next like couple of years? I'm really lucky because I got a faculty position. So I'm leaving the center in a few months, but whoever takes my position, hopefully will continue this project towards working with larger groups of dogs. So I know we're going to, we have a survey. I don't know if you've heard of the Seabark. So it's a survey that is sort of like a personality survey on dogs. And it looks at things like trainability and aggression. Um, and we created 
a new sea bark that's geared towards working dogs. And so we're going to sort of throw that out into the world to try and get a large number of working dogs to fill it out and potentially get their DNA just to increase that sample size that we need for the genetics and then, you know, keep moving um, towards that, you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, hopefully, which is, you know, some link between the genotype and the phenotype of these dogs. Yeah, interesting. Well, very good. What's the best way for people to find out more about uh, your research and to keep tabs? Probably my Twitter. Uh, I don't have any like website of my own, but my Twitter is at Jenny Esler. And that's where I kind of update what I'm doing. And I post lots of cute puppy pictures when I'm working with the puppies. So um, Mm. yeah, that's probably the best. Well, I guess last question. Have you found any dog breeds that are really unusual? They're just so different from all the other dog breeds that, you know, it just makes you curious about them. Well, it's funny, the dog sitting next to me, he was uh, he was the dog that I handled as a handler in our COVID detection study, is a small Munsterlander. I don't know if you've heard of that breed. It's a no. hunting breed, um, and he's very quirky, very different from like the Labradors and the Shepherds that I'm used to. I'm very intrigued with uh, where his work goes with me. A mu- what is he, a Munster what? A Munsterlander. So it's a German uh, pointing breed. So similar to it, like a German short hair pointer, but they look like a spaniel. He's a very cool dog, very, very good at detection work, but certainly not a dog that I'd ever worked with or heard of in the detection world. So yeah, that's yeah. a new, that was a new one for me. Okay. Very cool. All right. Well, very good. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. And uh, yeah, it's just a really interesting subject. You know, I love dogs and I know you do too, and they're just very lovable creatures. So it's, it's cool to learn about them. Yeah. No, I, I love my job. I can't I can't say enough how awesome it is to work with dogs every day. Excellent. Well, Jenny, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.